Welcome to the National Women's Fitness Academy podcast. We're here to talk about women's health, female hormones, body image, and all things health and fitness. Hello, girls, and welcome back to the Women's Fitness Academy's podcast. I'm your host, Siggy, one of the WFA's educators and a women's health and confidence coach. Speaking of confidence and speaking of health, I feel as if this time of year, a lot of there's a lot of socializing happening, and some people tend to have a little bit of anxiety around social circles and social connections. And today, I have brought Cherie on board. And for those who don't know Cherie, she's originally from Queensland. She actually is back to Queensland. We'll get back to that. But throughout throughout her time, she explored the world through various experiences like hiking and working on like really cool fucking yachts. And she found herself in Melbourne, found a job and initially didn't know anyone. And Through this, she has been able to break in and establish social circles that had become a little bit more challenging and difficult and how to navigate through the apps and having small talk, um, which made her feel really exhausted. So the realization of the importance of human connection over the past few years prompted her to go on a mission and help people reconnect through shared experiences. Now, she started all of this through social cooking classes at her home, and now she is running multiple events per month hosted in multiple states, and it is called Conscious Connection. Now, Sherry, I would love to start today's conversation with how did the idea of Conscious Connection come about? So, it's an amalgamation of quite a few different things. So I studied nutrition and dietetics at university and I was always very adamant that I wanted to help people from a proactive sense. And for me to be able to eat well, to be able to have good nutrition, you need to know how to cook. Mm -hmm. And if you have a really bad relationship with cooking and food because of whatever reason, maybe your parents didn't know how to cook. Maybe they didn't teach you. Maybe it was a chore. Um, But if you have a bad relationship with cooking, you're probably not going to be able to feed yourself very well. So I was always very um, on a mission, I guess, to help people in a proactive sense and to help them learn how to cook. And I always wanted, I knew I wanted to do something to do with cooking and helping people in that way. Uh, But when I moved to Melbourne, I started from complete scratch in terms of friends. All of my friends had moved away with COVID. Um, And so I was starting from complete scratch. And I'm a pretty sociable person, but I really struggled to find like those really deep, meaningful connections with people who wanted to talk about stuff that wasn't just work or the weather. So I I got really inspired. I actually met a lot of people through a group called Feel Good Dips. They go for a swim every Wednesday and Sunday. And um, I realized the importance of connection through that group. And I think coming off the back of COVID, we were all just so desperate for connection. So I thought, why not combine the cooking class idea with connecting people who wanted to make new friends. So yeah, I just set out to create the space where everyone would be in the same boat, where everyone wanted to make new friends and we could do a collaborative activity together and bond over food as opposed to alcohol, because I think food is something we can all relate to. It's delicious and it's fun to make. So it's really taken off since then. It's so cool that you've also mentioned how there's no alcohol involved it's literally a more of a life experience around food and socializing and networking because I find too often when you're wanting to socialize the easiest thing done is for someone to be let's go grab a drink and I'm so past that stage of drinking I think this year I've probably drank twice or three times and whenever someone brings up the topic of let's grab a drink, I'm just like, let's do like, let's do something else. Like, how about we have an activity or, you know, as you said, as uh, you said yourself, like doing a cooking class or something to be able to connect deeply and have more depth. Maybe that's just me, but I'm sure you can relate to this as well. Like we want to stop with the small talk and like, how can we change that narrative? And you're doing it like you're 
making it possible for people to experience this and contribute for it a little bit better. Can you share some memorable memorable moments from certain events that you've hosted this year? Oh, there's a lot, a lot to choose from, I feel. Um, I feel like there's a lot where people have come in, they're really, really nervous and they're like, they've almost turned around and gone home, but then they've actually pushed through, they've come to the event and they've thanked me afterwards and they've just been like, oh my God, that was so incredible. I met the most amazing people. We're going to brunch next weekend or whatever it is. And like, I was shaking in my boots when I first came here, Uh, but it's just, I think because when they realize everyone's in the same boat, everyone's nervous, everyone's feeling it a little bit. But once you realize that, the nerves just dissipate. Um, But there's a few other um, experiences or like um, success stories, if you will, from different people. I don't get to hear all of them, but I'd say one of my favorite ones is Malika. So she actually hosts The Conscious Connection in Melbourne now because she loved it so much. But when she first started, she came to the very first communal dining event and she wrote to me afterwards and just said, like, I was struggling so hard to like meet people and to like to have those good quality girlfriends, like the really like strong nourishing relationships. And she's like, I found so many people. We're going to brunch. We're going to this afterwards. And since then, she's been to so many different events and she's cross pollinated so many different groups of people that she's made throughout the different types of events. And she's always, 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 always going out with some of them. And she's even been to Tasmania with some of them. Uh, and there's even another group of girls who are now, they've started a book club. They're also going to Japan next year. They've been to the races. They've done all sorts of things together. There's just like all of these beautiful little friendship groups that have come out of it. And it's it's really fulfilling. I love the fact that there's friendships. I also want to chat about intimate relationships because I find that um, with you know, the last few years and maybe it is because of COVID or maybe it's just the way the world is progressing too often with dating and getting intimate with people has been a little bit of a challenging part for many people. And I can speak this from experience, like I'm no longer on the dating apps because they literally are so frustrating but again maybe that's just not not at the level that I'm wanting and and the standards and which is fine but I would love to know like how do you help people match at these communal communal um events because obviously there's always like a different and interesting point of view from yourself and from others when they um come to these events Mm -hmm. so the communal dining events I match people now I will sort of preface this with all of the events are generally with a focus on platonic friendship however if you find something romantic out of that great Um, but the way that I I match people so when you book your ticket I ask you a little bit about yourself I ask you about your relationship status and yeah most of the time I will match people based on friendships but sometimes I will find some people I'm like oh I feel like they would be really good together And so my sort of criteria is I try to match people similar-ish age so that the group um, age range is 20 to 40. So if you're 40, you're probably not going to be sitting with a 20-year-old and vice versa. So you'll be sat with someone similar in age. Uh, I generally look out for people who are the same type of people, people who are maybe like really outgoing and they're like people who want to party or put those kind of people together. There's some people who are like non-drinkers, they're more spiritual, personal development. I'll put those kind of people together. But we have seen some really good um, outside of friendships. We've seen a couple of really good actual like romantic connections happen. And I did run a few singles events and they will be coming back next year, which is exciting. Uh, And we definitely have a couple of couples who've come out of that, which has been just so cool. For those who are listening and has single, I'm sure they're probably thinking, what do these single events look like? Yeah, so for me, I am really, really passionately against speed dating. I hate the idea of having to repeat yourself every five minutes, making small talk and then being like, whoop, next person. So for me, my uh, singles events are kind of like group conversation and I will sort of present each group with like a, maybe a couple of questions or it might be like a moral dilemma where the whole group has to discuss what they would actually answer. 
And so instead of having to be like, okay, this is what I do for work and um, I live here and blah, blah, blah. You're kind of, you're getting deep into like a, a conversational topic and you're getting to see how each other's brain works. So you can be like, ooh, that guy has similar values to me. I actually want to go and get to know him later. So you kind of take a mental note and you find him later on in the night. But yeah, it, it's usually like group conversational sort of stuff uh, so that you get to talk to a few different people. You get to hear from a few different people. So it's less um, it's less intimidating and it's just a little bit nicer to be able to delve a bit deeper. Mm, I have not been to speed dating, but the fact of just repeating yourself and having small talk makes me want to vomit. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> have you no, been, thank have, you. No, thank you at all. What's your experience with speed dating? Have you done it? I've never done it. I've never been game enough to, to put myself through that because I just know that I would not enjoy it. I've been on the apps. The apps are terrible. And it's, again, it's also most of the time we just need to be able to vibe check people, I think. It's like there's a guy I'm dating at the moment and I had I seen him on Hinge or something, I probably would have swiped left. But he's the most incredible guy and just such a wild card. And had I not met him in person, maybe it would have never happened. So I think sometimes you need to get a vibe for someone by being there in person. And that's why I'm so passionate about having these in-person events. Mm, it it make, it truly makes such a big different, like difference meeting people in person. And as you said, when you're on the apps, you, you can't read the vibe. Like you might be reading what your thing is perceiving like a vibe and then you meet them in real life and you're like, oh, wow, like I was way off. Yeah. Exactly. And people will always present the best version of themselves or their version of themselves that they want to portray. And sometimes it just doesn't line up in person. So it's just so much easier to meet a bunch of people in one place. You get a vibe. You can sort of see if you actually do have a connection and then go from there. Mm. Speaking of connections, I know you're very big about having a variety of events, whether it's like picnics, game nights, um, you know, certain restaurants, the dinners, the cooking classes, how do you help people break free from this like awkward barrier and f- let them facilitate like real life meaningful connections? So we have lots of different events because there's different levels that people are comfortable with. So some people might not be comfortable going and having dinner at the communal dining event and sitting with a group of people for an hour and a half. So then we have things that are a little bit more lighthearted, like the the games nights and the hikes where you can kind of just sort of a bit of mingle here. And if you don't like that person, you can go over there. Um, and all of our events, we do lots of different connection activities. We do like name tags and stuff. There's all of these little things that we put into place to make sure that it's as easy as possible. And so that you're not just sort of thrown in the deep end and being like, uh, I don't really know what to do or who to talk to or how to start a conversation. There's always conversation starters to just sort of push past the usual. Oh, so what do you do for work? And one of the rules is that we don't talk about work um, or we try to keep it at least to a minimum, but it really does make for a much better experience where you get to delve a bit deeper into more interesting topics. Mm, it's so um, funny how that a natural state of getting to know someone on like the surface level base is like, what do you do for work? But like, that is the most least interesting thing about a person yet. We still go and ask that question. Yeah. And for me, like I find it, it's, I think it's a really important thing not to ask people what they do for work because some people are not where they want to be. Like Mm. some people are not doing the job that they had hoped that they would be doing at this age or whatever it is. And some people are really, really high up in their job and it's a really like ego inflated job and that changes people's perspective and treatment of you. And I don't think anyone should be treated any better or worse because of your job title. Like you are more than your job title. It's just something that you do. So it gives kind of levels the playing field for everyone and gives everyone a fair chance at making friends. Mm, it's so true wow I didn't even think about that and sometimes that can bring a lot of um, shame to people so again just to break the ice it's getting people to speak about other different topics to you know spark that interest yeah yeah like one of the things I do is I get people to write a name tag and I get them to draw a picture Mm. on their name tag so 
I usually say like draw a picture of something that you're passionate about or something that you love to talk about. So instantly when you go up to someone, you're like, oh, what's that? It's a plane. Oh, she likes to talk about travel. So you instantly can start talking about something that they enjoy talking about, that you hopefully enjoy talking about. And it's just a great little conversation starter. Mm, definitely. I love that. One of the things that I usually ask people when I meet them the first time is um, what do you do? What do you enjoy doing in your spare time? And I exactly. feel as if that is a really good question to get to know someone on a deeper level, because then you know, like what their hobbies, what are their activities and having a better understanding whether your values are met. And if you're going to be able to have the connection again, whether it's platonic or um, intimate relationships. Definitely. And it can also be a really confronting question for a lot of people because a lot of people do make their work their life. Mm. So then when you ask also, who are you outside of work? Or like, what do you do outside of work? They're just like, oh, I don't know. But then it kind of sparks a little bit of self-reflection, I think, for a lot of people. So it is a good thing. 100%. Speaking of self-reflection, I mentioned before how I find it so useful to making events low or no alcohol um, friendly. And, you know, it's obviously an interesting aspect of conscious connection. How does this choice contribute to creating an environment that encourage, encourages more open-minded or more authentic conversations? And like, what's the feedback that you've received from this approach? Mm. So, I really started doubting myself in terms of whether I should keep it low or no alcohol for a little while there. Uh, when I first started, that was something I was really passionate about and it was a big point of difference. But then as it sort of started to get bigger, I sort of thought, well, maybe people actually do want to drink and maybe I'm just sort of limiting people. So I put up a poll on my Instagram stories and over six, 700 people responded and overwhelmingly people were like, no, no, we want to keep it low or no alcohol. And I was really shocked, but really, really happy to hear that. And I think, um, I think because everyone, because people are expecting it to be a low or no alcohol, it's kind of also in the name, conscious connection. Like we're not going to get smashed here. So if you want a boozy event, you can go elsewhere. Like pretty much everything else is boozy, but if you want to actually come here and connect, you can. And I think because people know that it's a low or no alcohol event, they're sort of, their expectation is, okay, so we're going to connect on this level. No one's going to be shit-faced drunk and I don't have to deal with drunk idiots, which is also nice. Um, but I think people are really, really receiving it quite well. There's been a big shift towards drinking less or mm -hmm. not drinking at all. And it's nice for people to have that safe space where they know that other people are receptive to having deep conversations without having to have that social lubricant and everyone's just in the same boat. I think that is the most important thing there. Yeah, definitely. I saw this quote the other day that someone posted about um, alcohol. God, I'm trying to like remember it. It's It will come to me later. But in the aspect of speaking of alcohol is, again, like too often people are wanting to have alcohol, alcohol in a way to like self-soothe themselves whether mm. it is socially or it's like after a, you know, long day of work <laughs> and too often it's actually not serving us a purpose because we're not facing what's actually making us feel uncomfortable. And I love the fact that there isn't alcohol or oh, it's low to, to none alcohol in your events, because as you mentioned previously, it's encouraging, encouraging people to, build connections away from, you know, alcohol or certain other substances. Mm. I heard something a little while ago where they had described alcohol as kind of like training wheels and alcohol is amazing. Like, you know, I do enjoy a good drink and um, it really did serve a purpose for a lot of us in our younger years, sort of like from teenagers to young adults where it's given us the like the confidence to be able to sort of develop our personality and our social skills. But as we get a bit older, I feel like we should be starting to wean ourselves off that so that we're not constantly still relying on those training wheels to be able to be social. So that's what I'm really passionate about is like taking that away. Like, you know, you can still have a drink or two like to take off the nerves. Like some people really are super, super nervous when they rock up and that's quite common. Um, so just having a drink or two can help sort of 
lower that down a little bit but then after that we're trying to give you the skills give you the the tools that you need in order to develop those social skills without needing to be drunk to do that so yeah mm. god i remember my uh early 20s um of alcohol and partying you definitely served a purpose back then <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> we've all we've all been there hey and if you haven't that's okay as well you know as as we mentioned like everyone has different experiences um around alcohol and whether you like it or not you know I guess it's just a matter of um exploring how you're contributing better to you know building healthier relationships with people I would love to I would love for you to share some or one like pivotal moment or experience that inspired you to transition from you know full-time work to actually pursuing this career of creating um human connections Mm -hmm. so I used to work as a recipe developer for a food company and I did that for most of 2021 and then towards the end of 2021 we had a lot of lockdowns and everything we had a lot of um, people leave so I got seconded into marketing and Facebook ads and social media and I was running Facebook ads like day in day out staring at a screen soul sucking stuff you know I just it was not very fulfilling and my I lived in a house uh I lived in a share house sorry and my housemates both went away for the weekend and it was a very rare occasion that I would have the house to myself but I had been thinking about running this cooking class thing for so long and I just been thinking about it thinking about it and too scared to sort of bite the bullet but when they both left for the weekend I just thought to myself I was like all right if I don't do this now like if I don't test out this concept now I will never do this like I'll never start and that moment, I just, it's like etched in my memory forever, I think, because I was like, this is it. Do it or don't. And I was like, all right, I'm going to buy the bullet. I went to the shops, bought all the ingredients. I invited a bunch of friends over or like friends and friends of friends. And we ended up doing the dumpling night. And that was the first one. And everything just went so perfectly. Everything was on sale. I got a park right out the front. Like everything went smoothly by the end of the night. We we're pulling angel cards and going around the group talking about stuff and just like tears and hugs. And it was just so beautiful. And I was like, that was such a pivotal moment for me, just making that decision, everything going perfectly. And I think because it just went so well, it was just such a sign from the universe that this was actually what I was meant to be doing. So I think that was my my pivotal moment. And then I was like, I have to pursue this. And from then on, I I sort of ran a couple more events at friends' houses. And then I was like, okay, I need to find my own space. So I decided to move out. I found the most perfect apartment that had a rooftop kitchen with beautiful views that no one was ever using. And I was able to run my cooking classes out of there. So yeah, it just all flowed from there. I love the fact that there was no um resistance around this idea it was literally hey if I don't do this I just don't know how it's going to happen and a matter of fact I think a lot of people have awesome ideas but they don't eventuate to actually doing them and then they look back a few years later going ah I should have done that like what if and this and that what is like one tip you can give our listeners who are thinking of, you know, wanting to pursue a certain idea, but their fear is holding them back? Honestly, I think that fear is the worst. And I totally empathize with anyone who is feeling it, but you have to just start even if it's not perfect, and I think a lot of people get caught up on this, is they they want things to be perfect. They want mm. things to be like the exact right way. And like, I am by no means a perfectionist. I'm like, all right, let's just ready. What is it? Ready, fire, aim. Like yes. you just Sometimes you just need to do something, even if it's not perfect, even if it's terrible. Like mm. as you continue to do stuff and like be consistent with it, you will get better and that consistency is key as well because a lot of, I've seen a lot of people start events so like they start something they do it once or twice it's a lot of work and then they give up but you have to realize that it's going to take time yeah. it's going to be hard 
And if you continue to be consistent, it will pay off, but you have to keep going with it. So that would be my biggest thing. My biggest piece of advice is just, just start, even if it's not perfect and just be consistent, you will get better and it will get there. You just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. And it's so true because too often the fears that we have in our head is what holds us back. And I'm speaking about this from experience. There's been many times where I've wanted to do multiple things and then I step back and go, no, I'm not going to do it and I leave it. But then looking back, I always wonder like, what if I would have done that? Like why? Where this year has been the year of facing my fears. And I tell you what, facing your fears is fucking scary, but you get so much confidence from just putting yourself out there, whether it's, you know, going to in-person connections or asking someone on a date or pursuing a new career. It's just like, knowing not to let these fears get in your head, but also never letting failure get to your heart because too often people will hold themselves back because failure seems so scary, but it's just like, would you fear, would you rather fear failing or would you rather fear the opportunity of succeeding, but still going and pursuing it? Mm, Exactly. And I think it is so important for people to realize that fear and anxiety and nervousness like all of those things are completely normal like it's okay to be fearful doing stuff like so many people almost don't come to my events because they're so nervous they're like I my social anxiety this and my anxiety that and it's like anxiety is normal like I get anxious like, I've been doing this for two years and when I go and say my speech I look very cool calm and collected but I'm like Like if you look at my hands, I'm shaking and I'm so nervous, but I still just push through anyway. And that's the only way you can kind of get anywhere is you just have to push through, accept that fear and anxiety is a normal part of life. And on the other side of that is some of the best things you could ever ask for. So, yeah. 100% because like if you don't go for it, you're never going to know what the answer is, whether you were successful doing it or whether it wasn't the right path, but it leads you to a different path. And as I yeah. mentioned, you know, as we've been talking, it's helping people navigate the anxiety around these social events and knowing everyone else is as anxious as they are. Like we're all anxious human beings trying to connect with random people and just you know trying to do our best yeah and I always say to people I'm like if you're anxious or nervous just go up and tell someone hey I'm here by myself and I'm really nervous how are you feeling and I pretty much guarantee you they're probably going to say the exact same thing so it sometimes it helps to be honest and to bond with each other through that shared feeling of of anxiety or whatever it is that you're feeling. Yeah, completely. Honesty and vulnerability. That's what brings us humans together. And if we're putting this facade on that everything's okay or pretending that, you know, nothing's wrong, of course, it's not going to be relatable. Of course, you're not going to be able to authentically have these human connections because you're not acting as yourself. You're acting as someone else. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love this. I would love to know what made you move back to Queensland? I had been wanting to move back since I left six years ago. So um, I worked on Super Yachts for three years and then I moved to Melbourne for almost three years. And uh, I think it was a phone call with my best friends where I was like, oh, I just really want to go back to the Gold Coast. Like, I just love the way that I feel. I feel very peaceful and just at home when I'm here and she was like Sherry you've been saying this for six years and I was like oh okay and I think because I'd been really debating because I love Melbourne like Melbourne is such an amazing city and I've built such an amazing community and friends there it was going to be really hard to leave but it was just a feeling of home and a feeling of like yeah peace and my nervous system sort of feeling very calm uh, that I was really missing because yeah it didn't matter how hard I tried and I gave Melbourne a really red hot go but um it just never felt like home for me so yeah that was so I, I decided to move back and I'm really glad that I have it's been yeah quite life-changing mm, life-changing how so 
I think it's allowed me to, or it's forced me to step back a little bit and to trust other people to run the events in Melbourne while I'm not there. Mm-hmm. So I have been coming down pretty regularly. I fly down like once a month or once every two months and host a few events. But in between those, I have a couple of amazing hosts who will run the events. And I think having moved back, it's forced me to trust them to do that. And they've really stepped up to the plate and they've really done a good job. So it's awesome to be able to see that happen. Mm -hmm. And I love that, that you've been able to let go of it, whether it was the sense of control of, you know, having to navigate everything or just having the trust within other people and seeing whether it was going to work or not. Yeah, exactly. So it's been really good. With your events, are they right now only in Melbourne or are you hosting them in different states as well? In different states as well. So they're mainly running in Melbourne, but do do a couple of events in Sydney and then Brisbane and Gold Coast. So now that I'm here on the Gold Coast, it's easier for me to just drive up to Brisbane or um, Gold Coast. So just trying to get those ones off the ground. brizzy has been quite popular and Sydney will definitely be popular. I'm just sort of uh, working out like some things with hosts at the moment. So once we get that all sorted, it's going to be humming quite like, quite nicely. Mm. What what do you take in consideration when you're looking at events or, you know, creating these human experiences for people? Um, I think it's really important for it to be a really good venue. It's um you don't want something there's there's so much like science and thought and experience that goes into picking a really good place like you want things to be quite intimate you want people to be able to sit in a certain configuration so that it feels yeah intimate and so that you can speak to other people I'd say something that's even um uh even in the way that it's like an open plan or whether it's something that's kind of got big pillars in between like you want things to be quite open so that everyone can see each other and it's easy to move around and um of course, we want good food. That's one of the sort of common elements of conscious connection. There's always some element of food because we're using that as opposed to using alcohol to connect. So you want to have some place that has good food as well. Uh, but yeah, I think there's quite a few, quite a lot that goes into it. I won't give away all my secrets, but yeah. <laughs> Well, for those who um, want to be part of this, make sure that you um, check uh, Shuri's um, page. It's Conscious Connection. Where else can uh, people find you? I'm also on TikTok. um, And otherwise, you can also check out the website. So it's www.ccdinners.com. And then you can see what's on in all of the different states on there as well. I love this. What are one of the big goals for 2024? For conscious connection for 2024 I would love by the end of the year to be in all the major cities in Australia definitely going to focus mostly on the east coast for now and just get those running really nicely and get something yeah quite regular going uh, but yeah I think Australia-wide domination hell yes <laughs> I would love to be the first thing that people think of when they have a friend or a family member who's moved to a new city and I, and they're looking for friends and I want people to be like, okay, you need to go to a conscious connection event. Mm-hmm. Well, spread the word, everyone. I think um, for those who feel a little bit anxious about meeting people, this is your opportunity to start making friends. And, you know, like you said, what's a better opportunity for you to meet people in person instead of swiping across apps? Exactly, exactly. And you get to enjoy good food together. Hell yes. You say food, I'm there. (laughs) I love that so much. Um, Shuri, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I know a lot of our viewers and listeners are going to get a lot out of this, especially for those who, you know, like me, experience social anxiety, but we still go for it and we still, you know, show up and get it done. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure to chat to you.